Amen. So I, I titled this sermon, I titled it Together in Thought and Purpose. And it's 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 17. So if you want to turn there, we're going to get there eventually and read it, but I want to share a few things first before we get there. In our culture, we put celebrities and those who have accomplished great things, we put them up on pedestals oftentimes. We we revere them because of their accomplishments, maybe their status, probably their success even. We do this all the time. And is it right or wrong? You know what? I'm going to leave that to you to judge for yourself. In the Christian arena, we have our favorites oftentimes. Our favorite pastor, our favorite ministry, favorite band, uh, our favorite church, favorite Bible, favorite group leader, youth group leader, whatever it is, our favorite curriculum even. While in and of itself, these things are not necessarily wrong, they can become very problematic almost immediately, and I dare to, I, I dare to say problematic without notice even, until division has already taken, taken root. Until pride has already laid its foundation in hearts. Until pride has laid its foundation for a breeding, for breeding a sense of superiority and, and devastating division that has harmed, that will harm the testimony of the church. I will never forget going to a youth specialist conference years ago and hearing a comment that was made by a Christian band that has stuck with me forever. Okay, and this was probably 20, 21 years, 22 years ago now. We were in, in a huge group of people at this conference, big hotel, lots of people around, youth group volunteers, youth pastors, and we were in line waiting for an elevator, and all of a sudden the door opens. It was the band Third Day, if you guys know who Third Day was, and at that time, like, they were one of the bands, the bands. And all of a sudden, you could hear people in the crowd gasp and scream and start talking quite loud, loudly in great awe of this band, Third Day. And I will never forget what a couple of the band members very, very, very clearly said. We're just normal people here serving Jesus. There was a very famous pastor, and I'm not going to give his name, who has great ability to speak. He's animated. He's a great storyteller. He's a gifted orator. He's very strong in teaching the truths of Scripture, great visionary, and really had a heart for people to love the Scriptures, understand the Scriptures, and for people also to love, to live out those Scriptures. Well, this church became a mega church, became huge. And it really started to break his heart because of what happened to church attendance when he wasn't there. People were being enamored with the famous and the successful, what in the world, I have a back page, this puppy here. <laughs> it really started to break his heart because of church attendance, how it dropped on the Sunday mornings that he did not preach. He became haunted by a few things that his leadership was saying about him too because they were putting him on a pedestal. Many people were becoming more enamored by him than the message. So after some time of prayer, seeking the Lord's conviction, talking with his wife, he stepped down from ministry and he chose to go a totally different direction in ministry. Still writing thought-provoking books, still preaching at times, but stepping out of the limelight and into grassroots, hands-on ministry. He did not like that people were disciples of him instead of disciples of Jesus. That's pretty bold, by the way. I mean, that's, huge. that's hugely bold. We need more of that in the church. And may we as believers not perpetuate that problem either. Because when we begin to put these people and these ministries up on pedestals, we begin to make them idols. We begin to fuel pride. We begin to put them on the same level as Jesus. We, both those leading and both those following, we create an, an opportunity for spiritual abuse when we do that. We create an opportunity for unhealthy division. 
Because it shifts our focus away from how amazing Jesus is and his message, and instead it puts focus on the failures of the people of God. When I was leading a youth ministry many years ago, there was a group of us youth pastors that would get together and we would plan events for our youth groups. We would take turns teaching, leading the music, uh, planning the games, and we would take turns at different locations where we would meet. And there was this one youth group that I always felt super uncomfortable around. There was this arrogance and there was this sense of superiority that would come across, not only, not only from the kids, but even from some of the volunteer staff as well. Their church was the best. Their youth group was the best. They had the best games, the best whatever, you name it. I'm all for people, by the way, having pride in their church. All for that. You should like where you're at, and you should feel a deep connection there. That's, that, I mean, I think that should, be, that should go without saying. But this just seemed to cross the line into pride and arrogance on their part. When we would meet in small groups and we would discuss the message of that night when we all got together, many of the youth from that church would answer questions like this that were asked. Well, my leader said this. Or they would say, you know, our church believes this. Or it was, you know, my pastor said, and you may be thinking this, so what's the problem with that, Greg? <laughs> These are young people that lack experience. They're, maybe they're immature in their beliefs and their, in their faith. And I agree, I agree, give grace. And that's what I chose to do. But at the core of their hearts was not Jesus and the message. It was the church and what the pastor said it was a subversive culture of competition for whose ministry, whose church, whose pastors were the best. That's what was breeding. And we, by nature, as people, we easily get sucked into this stuff, into some form of competition. Being enamored with the famous and the successful looking people is absolutely, it's dangerous. Very easily does it infiltrate and create problems within the church walls. Competition between curriculum ministries, pastors, churches, it's a real problem in the church. In our passage this morning, Paul's appeal for unity is extremely strong. I mean, that's why he writes this letter to the Corinthian people. Paul's appeal for lack of competition, or... He, 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 his appeal was for the lack of competition, but instead the intention of living like we are on the same team, fighting for the same purpose, that's what he wanted people to experience. Paul wants the church of Corinth to be of one mind, unified together in thought and purpose, living in harmony together, so that, because this is the important part, the message of Christ would have power. That was the purpose. So let's read our, our passage this morning. 1 Corinthians, like I said, 1, verses 10 to 17. It says, I, he said to them, he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. And then he says, he says, has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any, any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. He says, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh, Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else, he says. Verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So I'm going to break the passage up this morning into four areas. Verse 10, the appeal that he makes. Verses 11, 12, the problem that he points out. 13 to 16 is argument. And then verse 17 really is like, the, it's, the real, it's the great leveler. 
So look at verse 10, if you would. Because this is really where he, he sets the stage. He's, he's setting the stage for the next three chapters of what he's going to write to them. He's, he's setting the foundation in our passage for what he's going to talk about in the, in the next, like I said, three chapters. Paul says this. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters. That word appeal there in the original language, that's a word of force. It's a word that has an expectation tied to it that you will look in that direction and you're going to make it happen. So you can kind of understand. I mean, he's, he's really urging them. He's really putting something here, some weight on what he's saying. And he says this. He says, brothers and sisters, because he's laying, leveling the playing field here. He's speaking to the family of believers as a whole when he writes this. And really to every single one of us because this is, can be extrapolated out to us. He's he's saying this, he's saying, in this, dear brothers and sisters, there's this unity that runs deeper than even the blood of family. It's a unity that's based upon, it's found in the blood of Christ. It's an eternal unity. And then the very next thing Paul says is, by the authority of Lord Jesus, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you know, Paul is not saying, listen to me because I'm someone great. Okay, this is kind of the clarity here real quick. He's saying, listen to Jesus. Listen to God's heart, his purpose. And what Paul wants to do is he wants to put the focus upon Christ, not on man. And then Paul gives this appeal. He says, I want you to live in harmony. I want you to be of one mind, unified in thought and purpose. And before I go farther, really, are there things that we should be divided on? And I would say, yes, there are. But we're not going to get into those really today. Because that's not the point of what Paul's trying to get at. What Paul's trying to get at as brothers and sisters of Christ, as those who are in the body of Christ, let's get unified. He gets to some of that other stuff a little bit later in in. Corinthians. So if you want to know what it is, come for the rest of this book. (laughs) Paul gives the appeal. He says, I want you to live in harmony. I want you to be of one mind. I want I want you as believers to be unified in thought and purpose. Unity is a big topic all throughout Scripture for the believer. The Bible has a whole lot to say about unity. One of the first unions outrightly spoken of is the union of marriage between a man and a woman in Genesis 2. That's one of the first ones where it's it's laid out clearly that we're created to be in union as people. In Deuteronomy 6.4, it says the Lord is one. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. They are one. They're in perfect unison. There's There's another piece where we see union. There's a union in the Godhead. There's supposed to be union between married couples. Another one. Jesus in John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. That's just another piece of the Godhead of Jesus and the Father being one. And then it goes, and and in 1 Peter, or um, in John 17, let me back this up a second. In John 17, we see also that you and I, as believers, we have a unity, a union with Christ. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. That said, I forget, it's like something 300 times in Scripture. It's a lot. And then also, if you look at 1 Peter, it speaks of that Jesus is the cornerstone, and you and I are the living stones that are placed upon that cornerstone. We're part of the the same building. There's a union there. John 15 speaks of a vine. He's the vine. We are the branches. There's a union there. He abides in us, we abide in him. Also, Ephesians 5.30 says, we are members of his, Christ's body. Ephesians 4 says that, you know what, that you and I, we're united in spirit, in in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. He is the unifying factor. He's a seal upon our lives, and it's the same spirit in me, the same spirit in you. There is a strong sentiment and a call, even, towards unity for the believer in God-ordained relationships. 
in, in Christ. One commentator read, said this, he said, Unity in Christ means that all believers are in a relationship with Christ and by extension to every other believer. All believers are united with each other, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, or whether they feel like it or not. The challenge of Christian unity is to live up to the truth of that reality. Since we are all members of one body, we need to live like it. This means subordinating our individual needs to the needs of the body at large and using our individual gifts for the good of the whole body, he says. Unity takes work. You guys agree with that or disagree? It takes a lot of effort. It takes intent. It takes being not self-centered but Christ-centered with a sensitivity and love for others as Christ himself had. Listen to Ephesians 4, verse 3. It says this, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. And right before this, Paul says, he tells us how to do this. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. And he says, this is the hard part, to me is sometimes to be the harder part of all this. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humble and gentle. That is your responsibility to be intentional to come across that way. Okay, let me say that again. In that scripture, I think it's your, your individual responsibility, my individual responsibility to come across as humble and gentle. The be patient and making allowance part, that is your responsibility, my responsibility to be intentional how you are to be towards how others come across to you. Does that make sense? Paul in Philippians 2, he chimes in again with a call to unity. Because this, I mean, it's all throughout Scripture. He says, agree wholeheartedly with each other. He's talking to the believers now, remember. He's not talking to those outside the church. He's talking to those inside the church that are dear brothers and sisters in the Lord. He says, agree wholeheartedly with each other. Love one another. Work together with one mind, one purpose. And then he, he goes on, he says, after that, he tells us how that we're supposed to go do this. He says this, he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for, only for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. <laughs> it just levels the playing field right here. What was the attitude that Jesus had? I think he can sum the next six verses up this way. Surrendering the need, the want to be important, and desires, submitting in obedience to God, and then serving God and others, leaving the results up to God. I think that's the heart of Philippians 2, 6 through, I think it's 10. And it's interesting to note, when you look at the original language of Paul's appeal here in verse 10, that he uses words that have a lot of weight to them. He's using words that, that lend towards intention, striving, and work. You and I, we're being called to live in harmony with each other. That's hard to do when you look at the backgrounds, the histories, where we come from. I'm from California. You guys gave me grace on that one, right? <laughs> I drive a Ford. <laughs> I knew I'd wake a few of you up at that one. <laughs> We're being called to live in harmony with each other. What that does mean, though, is that there's a possibility of division within us. That is the idea of what Paul is saying in Ephesians 4 when he says, keep, or another translation says, maintain the unity of the Spirit. Keep yourselves united in the Spirit. It's something that takes careful observance, it takes protection, it takes intent, and it takes striving. But there is a right way to do it, though. And Paul's been clear about that in two different passages. Be humble and be gentle. Or that word is also meekness, by the way. And then he uses the word division. That word division is speaking of not of two different groups, necessarily. What that word is division is, is something that was one that has now been torn apart. Like a piece of clothing that got ripped, right? When you slide into the ba in base or you walk across a 
blackberry bush or something or whatever. It's, it's this idea of one thing that's been ripped into two. It's torn apart. And the words, when he says, be of one mind, it literally means to say the same thing. To, to, to be of one mind. And it's not speaking about we need to conform to each other. That's not what he's using. It's a different kind of um, saying the same thing. It's an idea of unity. Because that is different than conformity, by the way. Because unity can have a disagreement within it, but the foundation, the purpose has to still be the same. This is why I don't necessarily have a problem with denominations. If and only if they emphasize what is important and they're not emphasizing the non-essentials. What is important is the gospel message. Those things that are salvation issues and the call to godly living. What is non- a non-essential is that which does not affect salvation and does not change godly living. Those to me are non-essentials. You may be, um, Jesus coming back before the tribulation or he's coming after the tribulation. You know what? He's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I can find just as many people that land in one part of what it looks like, what they call eschatology, eschatological theology kind of stuff. I can find one person that lives in that area, and I can find another person who lives in a totally different one. But if they come together and they say this, you know what? We actually aren't totally sure. We're just kind of taking scriptures, and we're doing our best to figure this out. But we do know this. Jesus said he's coming back. He's coming back. He's faithful to his promises. Now, my thinking is, I'm a pre-tribber. He's coming back before the tribulation. If you think he's coming back after the tribulation, get the keys out of my pocket. Lock the doors, please. Because <laughs> I won't be around. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> That'll go to the pride and arrogance point here in a minute. So, <laughs> no, That's right. <laughs> Like I said, what's important, though, is the gospel message. The things that are salvation issues and the call to godly living. That is what we got to hang our hats on. Those are things where division may have to happen. Being unified together is of utmost importance to Jesus. Listen to John 17. When Jesus was praying, it's called the high priestly prayer. When Jesus was praying to God shortly before he was put on the cross... In that last week there somewhere. Probably in the last night, I believe. John 17, 20 and 21 says this. He says, Jesus, he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So understand this. Jesus didn't just pray for his disciples. He prayed for you as an individual. That's pretty powerful stuff. And then he says, I pray that they will all be, anybody know the next word? One. Unified. Together. He doesn't pray this to be cute, by the way. He prays that because of the reasons said in that prayer, if you read through it. He knows that the world is going to hate believers. He knows there's going to be strife and struggle there. He knows that there is an enemy of God who wants to tear apart, to divide the body of Christ because he knows that that's going to destroy their witness. Why would we believe anybody that's in chaos and confusion and button heads that looks like the rest of the world doesn't that look like our political system today too i mean we're all we kind of get about that stuff i mean why wouldn't they do the same about the people of christ when we are on opposite ends and we're button heads verse 23 of that same john 17 he says this catch this he says may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. When the body of Christ is unified together in thought and mind, there is power in the testimony of Christ. The gospel becomes real. It becomes something to actually hunger for at that point. We live in a world, like I said, division, hostility, strife. Everyone in this world is searching for peace. We're to be people that exude peace. The peace that comes from knowing God. 
Jesus' high priestly prayer, prayer, along with many of the other verses, it shows the importance of God the Father and the God's, of God's Son being one in mind. When you look at John 17, John 10, John 8, I mean, there's a bunch of it where it talks about he and the Father are one. There's a lot of verses. There, there is something super important about that. And Jesus even says that you and I, that we are one in mind, we're to be one in mind with him, that we are one in him, we're in Christ. And if it's commanded by Jesus, it might require our attention. Psalms 133.1 even says this, it says, how wonderful and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. That's the appeal. Let's look at verses 11 and 12, which is the problem here. He's going to attack the problem. So apparently, word gets packed to Paul through Chloe's family, the household, may even be the, the people that were part of the household that were not family. And there's this, this word that gets brought back that there's quarrels within the church. There's problems. There's strife. There's, there's fighting. And apparently, it's, it's quarrels about who's the greatest leader in that church. Who's the one that we should listen to and follow? Paul, at this point, when he wrote this letter, he's only been gone 18 months from when he was in Corinth, and he started the church. And it did not take long for the root of dissension to find its way in. That's, that's a scary thing. Some said they were followers of Paul. Paul founded the church. Paul ministered too. He shared the gospel with the Gentile people in, the, in, in Corinth as his ministry was mainly focused on the Gentile people. And because those people had a connection with Paul, they put Paul as, I'm going to listen to Paul. Paul. Paul knows. Some said they followed Peter. Peter probably never even came to Corinth, but the Jews that were there may have had a stronger connection to Peter because he was ministering to the Jews. Maybe they even heard Peter in Jerusalem at Pentecost. So they have this natural connection there. And plus you got some Jews that actually, they thought, eh, Paul's not really an apostle. He wasn't part of the 12. So we really can't take that dude seriously. So you got two factions now, people. And then you got this group that says, hey, you know what? We're followers of this guy named Apollos. Apollos was a very eloquent speaker. He was an extremely um, known orator. And most likely because of that, because he had, he had been in, and he actually had firsthand, he was in Corinth, living on the church of Corinth for the time that Paul was gone. So there's this group of people that were connected to him. And most likely, because of who Apollos was and his education and everything, and his ability to speak the way he did and how clear he was and how he could just draw an audience in, he probably attracted the wealthy and the educated, the very distinguished types. That's kind of what... So you got these three groups of people. One commentator said this, he said, if they think that their preferred leader, Paul, Apollos, or Peter, is superior to other leaders, then they will feel superior to followers of other leaders. I thought that was an interesting quote. And I think that's true. Anytime you start putting your leader above, you know, you put somebody above somebody else in the church in the sense that they, they're a little bit better, you know, you start embarking on this journey of, well, he's superior to those people. And then... The people that follow that, that other guy, you begin to have the sense that you have more knowledge. You're a little bit better than they are. And then there's this fourth group that I thought was kind of interesting. Some said they follow only Jesus. This one sounds good, right? I don't think that it is meant in a good manner. I don't take this as the group that had it figured out, and the reason why is because of the context of what is, where this is at. These guys are quarreling. There's these four groups quarreling against each other. And the 
the, the followers of Paul, the followers of Peter, the followers of Paul, and those that said, hey, I'm only of Christ. <laughs> and I think that's kind of how they said it. They had the sense of superiority because, hey, we only follow Christ. When you guys figure things out, <laughs> you'll be like us. <clears throat> we have a special in with God that, you know what, you guys don't have because you just, yeah, you're just not there yet. There was a pride and a superiority in each of these groups that, ha- that, that was causing inappropriate divisions within the church. Whenever pride steps in, it will lead to some, for- some form of su- a superiority complex. complex. Pride makes us believe that we have a special end that others don't have. And that's, I will tell you, at the core of a lot of things I've ever seen within the church where there starts to be a little bit of quarreling and fighting, a little bit of dissension or anything, I can tell you that's, that's almost always it. We've been going through Proverbs as a church. One of the Proverbs is very clear. Pride becomes before. Actually, it doesn't say that. <laughs> destruction and haughtiness or arrogance comes before a fall. I mean, it's kind of the same thing. I just wanted to be snarky. That's right. (laughs) Pride breeds and it leads towards destruction all the time. Not sometimes, all the time. No wonder Jesus was so adamant in his prayer about his followers being unified together in thought and purpose. Our hope is not in Glide Baptist Church. And I don't believe a lot of people in here think that way, to be honest, which is awesome. Our hope is not in this pastor or that pastor or this Bible study, that Bible study. Our hope is in Christ alone. And Paul really emphasizes that as he mentions Jesus Christ's name ten times in the first ten verses of 1 Corinthians. Paul is wanting to lay the foundation. He's wanting to make a point. He's wanting it to be on the front of their mind and so, so ingrained in the conversation he's having with them that all they walk away from with that whole thing is Jesus. Listen to Paul's argument in this next piece, right? So he's made the appeal. He's explained the problem. And now here's, here's his argument towards all of this. Verses 13 to 17a. Let me, let me read it again. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. He says, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that we were baptized, they were baptized in my name. Oh, you know, there's a couple other people I forgot about that baptized. And then he says, for Christ didn't send me to baptize. Interesting. Paul uses a set of rhetorical questions to get his point across here, which is actually a very big form of, I mean, it's just a great form of getting people to think and, and, and and arguing, if you will. In the original language, the wording and the way the questions are asked only leaves one possibility for an answer, and it's the it's a resounding no. So when Paul says, you know, was Christ divided? No, Christ is not divided. When he says, did Paul get, was I, did I get crucified for you guys? No. Paul was not crucified us. Only Christ was crucified for us. Were you baptized in Paul's name? He says, no. The answer is no. No one is baptized in Paul. We're only baptized into Christ. And Paul's argument is, and it's not about the mere mortal man, it's about Christ. I mean, it's just going to, we're going to, Our unity is in Christ. Our power is in Christ. Our oneness is in Christ. Our ministry is because of Christ. Our living is to be because of Christ. You you know, you get the point. It's it's almost sickening because of how many times it's in Christ. (laughs) But it's good because we need to remember in Christ. This is about Christ. Yes, God has gifted believers with certain gifts and abilities and talents, but they are for the purpose of lifting the name of Jesus high, making him known, not us. To be clear, though, in this, I want to make sure of one thing. To be clear, Paul is not lessening baptism. Because look at the first part of 17. When he say, when, what he is saying is that you who are baptized, or who you are baptized, is, less, is of less importance. That's the issue. The point of baptism is to point to Jesus, just like a testimony. A testimony is not about us. A testimony is about Jesus and what he did who he is. And in an, in an underlying way, 
I think Paul is also saying baptism is not what saves us. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn more of God's salvation. And I'm going to take us on a little rabbit trail real quick because I think this is important. Because I've, I've, this is kind of a, a struggling thing. That baptism, does it say is, you have to be baptized to be saved or not? No, you don't. Acts 2.38 is where people get confused. And I understand why. Because it says this, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So you get this repentance, turning to, towards God, repentance and forgiveness, or baptism, all placed in the same verse as speaking about salvation. Or is it? That part of the verse where it says, for the forgiveness of sins, gets tricky because it makes it sound like baptism, like I said, is required for salvation. Almost all the translations say it this way or some similar way. And the word for there can also be translated because of. And actually, in this context, because of the wording around and everything, it actually should be translated because of. That's a game changer, by the way, in what that sentence, that whole sentence is saying. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of sins. Being baptized in Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of sins. So that's already happened. Now there's a response to what's already happened. One guy said this, he said it this way, and I think this is great. Some think I need to be baptized to be saved. He says, no, you need to be saved to be baptized. Simple. And there are other verses that can, can, can in and of themselves seem a little misleading until you start reading the context about baptism. Because all of the ones that I know of that kind of get a little tricky answer this very question of context matters and answer the very question of the salvation saved? No. It's because of salvation that you're, or does salvation, do you, does baptism save? No, because it's a response to salvation. Paul's argument is this in what he's saying. Is we're all just tools. And in our culture, that's kind of a negative term. But in, in reality, we, you and I are tools. We're tools to point to Jesus. Well, that sounds kind of uh, arrogant on God's part. No, actually, that's a blessing to us on God's part because when we surrender to him and we are used by him, he actually glorifies, he actually blesses, he actually satisfies us because that's what we're built to do. Try and put a, wood, a square block into a round hole. It doesn't work very well, and the two things don't really, <laughs> they don't appreciate it. But when you take something that's meant to fit into something that, it just, it, it's it, It's good. I put a song on Facebook a few weeks ago that has hit me ever since the first time I ever heard it, and I'll, I'm going to read it here in a second. And we're going to take communion in just a minute here. Because I used to preach about leaving your legacy. And the way I spoke about it was just enough off because it was, how do you want people to remember you? And if you know the songs by Casting Crowns, it's called Only Jesus. And I want to read the lyrics because... These guys, these guys are pretty stinking legit if you know their story. He said, this is the song. Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself, dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers, but all an empty world can sell is empty dreams. I got last in the light when I was up, I got last in the light when it was up to me to make a name in the world the world remembers. But Jesus is the only name to remember. And then it goes in the chorus, and I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And I, I've only got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him, only Jesus. And it goes on, all the kingdoms built, all the trophies won, will crumble into dust when it's said and done. Because all that really mattered, did I live the truth to the ones I love? Was my life the proof that there is only one whose name will last forever? And I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And I, I've only got one life to live. 
I'll let every second point to him, only Jesus. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember, and I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And I've got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him, only Jesus. I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember, remember me, only Jesus. When people look at me, I don't want to be remembered as a great pastor or a great person, dad, husband, father, friend, as much as I want people to remember and think about Jesus when they think of me. I want their focus to shift off of this human and shift towards Jesus when they think of me. May, may Ephesians 5.1 be our life, and it says this, be imitators of God. May we so much imitate, may we so much mirror God that what people see is just that, God. That's the great leveler. The ground is level at the cross. The only celebrity, the only important person is Jesus. There are many great ministries, pastors, churches out there, but all of those are tools to reveal Jesus. Everyone has a role in the body of Christ. You and I have a role. None of our roles really are that much more important. We can't, I don't believe that we can truly live in the body of Christ and it be healthy if we live in such a manner where there is a part of the body of Christ that's not as important. In verse 17 of our passage, Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ will lose its power. Again, Paul's not downplaying the importance of baptism. What he is highlighting is the importance of the work of Jesus on the cross. And I know I've said that a bunch of times. But if Paul can say Jesus' name ten times in the first ten verses, I could say it the same thing five or six times in a sermon. <laughs> What's interesting about this verse, though, is this verse is a, trans, it's a, it's a transition into the next passage that we're going to look at next week. Paul is saying this. He's saying, look, it's not about your gift. It's not about how clever or how well put together you are in speech, your ability, your talent. As much as being willing and used to be, be willing and then be used by God for his glory. That's what matters. Corinth was an area where there's these great philosophers, these order, they would come to speak these fancy arguments and debates. People came from all over to hear these guys. And they gave them celebrity type status when that was the case. Because of how great they were, how f their words flowed, how they could lay an argument, the entertainment piece of it, how it made them feel. Paul did not want any of that to get into the way of the message of the cross. So he says, I'm not going to give any clever speech. You're not going to get anything special out of me. And actually, later on, it talks about how Paul was probably more, more or less, he was not a great orator. He just was a normal dude speaking. Moses, if you remember, when called by God to lead his people, he fought against God when God said, hey, Moses, I'm going to use you. No, God, that's a mistake. See, I, I think you've made a mistake here, God. I, I, don't, I can't speak. I've got a speech impairment. You know, I just, can you use somebody else? That's pride. That's pride that says, God, I know better than you. <laughs> he was thinking there had to be power in him in order to be able to do a good job. He had to put together, he had to be put together to do the work of God. God wants to use all of us, our quirks, our imperfections, the message of the cross is what matters. Let the impressiveness of the message itself be the power behind what you do. Don't get hung up on, well, I don't really know how to share the gospel all that well. Or, or you know, I kind of fumble over this. I don't, know all, I don't know enough scripture. That is probably the enemy of God saying, I'm going to take you out of the race, buddy. <laughs> Let's be about the ministry of, of, of the cross. It's not about Jew, Gentile, female, young, old. We all have a part to play, you and I, but for the same purpose, together in thought and mind. Augustine said something I thought was pretty interesting. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. And I think that's a true statement. 
<clears throat> we're going to take communion. There's a whole 